Okay, hello and welcome to this live Q&A hosted by the Cleft Lip and Palate Association on the subject of dentistry and dental hygiene. Uh, sorry for the delay folks, had a few technical difficulties there, but we are here and we are live now. Uh, my name is Sabrina. I am uh, one of the volunteers here at Clapper. I've been volunteering for almost 10 years now, and I was also born with a bilateral cleft lip and palate. Today, I'm joined uh, by Ellie. Ellie, do you want to introduce yourself? Thanks, Steph. Um, yeah, my name is Ellie, and uh, my connection to cleft is that I have a unilateral cleft lip and palate. Um, I've been volunteering with Clapper for about seven or eight months now. Thanks, Steph. Amazing. Great. Thank you, Ellie. Um, we'd also like to welcome the cleft specialists, uh, Media Mina Badia Nathan, Matlock, and Rhiannon Jones be answering your questions. Uh, later on in this event, we are also very pleased to be welcoming Grace and Alana from the Children and Young People's Council, who will be giving a short insight into their experiences with dentistry as part of their cleft journey. Uh, Mina, Matt and Rihanna, would you guys like to introduce yourselves? Yes, um, so my name is Mina Bidia Northern. Um, I'm a consultant in paediatric dentistry, working at the Everly and London Cleft Service. So that's at Guys and St Thomas's NHS Foundation Trust. Um, I've worked for the Clever and Palette Unit as a consultant for 10 years, but I also did some work there as a trainee. So thank you. After you, Rhiannon. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Rhiannon Jones. I'm a dental hygienist and dental therapist in the Southwest. So I work in Bristol Dental Hospital. I've worked for the team for 15 years, but my volunteering side of it is quite new. Um, just thinking of clever ways to raise money for Clapper as well. Amazing. Uh, good evening, Thank everybody. You guys. My name's, oh, sorry. Sorry. My name's uh, Matthew Locke. I'm a restorative dental consultant. Uh, I work in Morrison Hospital in Swansea in South Wales as part of the South Wales Clapper, Clapper and Palette team. Amazing. Thank you, guys. Thanks for introducing yourselves. Uh, so we just firstly would like to thank you all for joining us today. Um, and thank you as well to everyone who has submitted a question in advance. Um, we have had a lot of really good interest. Um, if you have a question while watching, please do pop it in the comments uh, below. And someone from Clapper will either respond directly or pass it on to us to ask the team here on Zoom. Um, we've had a lot of interest on this topic, so we will do our very best to answer everyone's questions. However, if there are any that we don't get around to answering this evening, um, then we will try and get back to you in the chat feature after the event. Um, we also do just want to take the opportunity to let you know that Clapper's annual survey is now live. Uh, okay. um, we'll pop a link to this in the chat feature underneath this video as well. On there, uh, there is a section that asks about any concerns you might have regarding healthcare, healthcare including dental health and access to NHS dentistry. Uh, Clapper can then use this information to identify what are the biggest concerns for people affected by cleft and decide what, as a charity, we should be prioritizing. Thanks, Ellie. That's really useful to know. Uh, right, I guess we better get on with these questions. So for the first part of this event, we'll be focusing on questions regarding paediatric dentistry. Then after the stories from our young people, we'll move on to the questions regarding adult dentistry. All right, um, I'll kick us off with question number one. Um, okay, so let me open to you guys. So is it more common for children born with a cleft to have more issues with their teeth, even when not related to their cleft? Uh, my son, who is five, has worn has had worn down teeth at the front and a hole in one of his back teeth, even though we are brushing twice a day. As a side note, he has also a massive fear of any health professionals looking in his mouth. So getting him seen by a dentist has been a challenge in itself. Over to you guys. Okay, I'll kick off with that question. Thank you very much. A lot of things within that question, so I'll answer them bit by bit. Um, the first thing was, I mean, thank you for this question. Um, in terms of um, issues with teeth, we do have paediatric dentists as part of um, the, cleft, the cleft unit. We are part of the cleft team. And the reason is, there are challenges um, regarding children, you know, with clefts and their teeth. 
Children with cleft upper palate are more prone to having dental decay compared to non-cleft children. And there have been various studies that have looked at the reasons behind it. But that's why it's really important that dental health is a priority and from an early stage. Um, as I said, the things that we tend to find that are issues um, regarding its dental decay is, is, is a factor, but also things such as extra teeth. Some children have missing teeth. Um, as the pattern of teeth comes through, it can be slightly different to children, to children that do not have cleft lip and palate. So I always say to parents, don't compare siblings because things happen quite differently. And I'm sure um, you guys have got experience of that. Um, in our unit, we tend to see children for their first dental assessment at 18 months. The reason we have the 18 month appointment is it's after they would have had their surgery. So obviously the priority at the beginning is the surgeries, the, the lip surgery, and the palate surgery. So things like teeth um, are something that we focus on at the 18 month. And at that appointment, myself and my, my dental colleagues um, go through preventive advice. So we talk firstly about brushing. So I'm sure there'll be questions about that later about, you know, when should we start brushing our children's teeth? Um, and my advice is as soon as the first tooth comes through, just start getting the, the brush in and just getting them used to um, brushing their teeth. In terms of toothpaste to use, um, it, we all know about fluoride and, why, and how fluoride is good for your teeth. Um, and we recommend a, a fluoride toothpaste. We've got, you know, children's toothpaste, but for children with cleft and palate, we tend to go for the slightly higher dose of the three to five um, for, the, for the little ones. And we actually give those um, in packs to um, parents as part of, you know, when they first come to our service, our CNS does give that. So we talk about toothpaste. We talk about diet as well. And especially in young children, there's all this thing about breastfeeding, bottle feeding. Um, and my advice is it's really about, obviously, in the first six months, it is, you know, where possible um, breastfeeding or um, and, I'm, and bottle feeding. And the CNSs work really closely with families to support that. But in terms of introducing solid foods, um, we tend to start um, advising that around six months. The key here is all about it's it's how often and when so most kids when they come at 18 months they're still in a bottle and what my advice is is we need to try and stop the night bottle because at night we are not designed to eat or drink or speak as we do in the day and we all have saliva in our mouth and what the saliva does it neutralizes acids so we all have bugs in our mouth in a nutshell um, so and some are good bugs and some are bad bugs and if we feed them the sugar they produce acids which basically cause the holes in our teeth. The saliva um, neutralizes, kind of buffers the acid. So you need to give time for saliva to work. And at night where we produce less saliva, um, it, you, the teeth aren't going to have that protective effect. So having a bottle of milk, or because um, milk has natural sugars or, or you know, sugary drinks at night can put the teeth at risk. So our advice is water at night. So, um, so in terms of going back to the question, children with cleft and palate and dental problems, yes, they are more prone to having it, but it's getting them been seen regularly. We'd like to signpost you to dentists. Now, I know there's a question later on about that, so I'll come back to that. Um, um, and the other thing that you're talking about is a fear. And we do find a lot of children with cleft and palate, because they've had so much surgery and things in their mouth, there is this anxiety. Um, but it's about getting them seen regularly, it's getting them used to having it. So even if they, when they come and they sit on the mum's lap or, or dad's lap and we just have a little look, it's just getting that regularity. Um, there are challenges with finding local dentists in the area. And I think there is a question, shall I answer that now or do you want to answer that in a... Um, uh, maybe when the next question comes in. So yeah. But I think, in, in essence, it's all about brushing twice a day, using a fluoride toothpaste and, um, you know, checking in with um, the dental team um, to get the advice. Hello, I could add to that if you don't mind as well. I'm just thinking from the perspective of um, how you can get them a bit more used to coming to the dentist, because as a dental therapist, I do spend a lot of time acclimatising children to be able to sit in the chair. Um, so it's about making brushing fun. It sounds like you're doing it twice a day, which is great, but, but maybe buy two or three toothbrushes if that's possible. So you give them a little bit of an option, maybe two different flavoured toothpaste. So they've always got the choice. So it's trying to find ways that are making it fun, maybe a star chart. You can go on the Internet and print off a free one and maybe just get a little sheet of stickers that they get a little sticker every time they do it on the chart, those, those sorts of things. And you can sort of play at the dentist you know you can pretend to be the dentist they can look in your mouth you can even buy sort of little disposable 
plastic mirrors. Don't let them run around with them, obviously, but you can play at the dentist. Here are some really nice books, children's books that are around visiting the dentist and also BBC Bite Size. So the, the BBC website for children, they actually have some really nice videos made yeah. by people they're used to seeing on the Internet and on, on TV as well. That you that It just might help build up their bit of confidence and normalise it. That, that was all I wanted to add. And just going on from that with the plastic mirrors, we do give them out to some of the, you know, after we've used them, we give them to the parents. Another thing, um, a technique, so I use something called a two toothbrush technique, which is kind of uh, going back to what you're saying about multiple toothbrushes. So what I sometimes say is I give the child a toothbrush, they can kind of chew on it, and then the mum can get another toothbrush or dad and then get in, so it kind of props them open. Because what we sometimes find with, with the parents saying, we can't get a toothbrush in the mouth, or they want to do it themselves and you know don't want us in. So try and make it a more collaborative and fun Thing for them so it, it becomes it's not a chore we don't want to traumatize um children having their teeth brushed we want them to enjoy it and you know you hear these stories of i'm having to pin them down to get a toothbrush in their mouth but as you say bbc bite size a lot of um, um these um companies since done it lots of different colgate there's numerous companies they have a lot of good resources online it's free you can go on videos um you know cartoons um, lots of things um, songs as well because it's all about the timing and you know what I sometimes say to parents oh how long should I brush their teeth for well a song a pop song is about two minutes so you know unless it's a extended the, the song and you know whatever so but an average song is about two minutes so they can play a song um, toothbrushes have timers as well so there's plenty of things as, as Rhiannon says that we can try and you know use to try and help them to enjoy uh, as opposed to being a chore but that's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Hi, right, Ellie, over to you. So we've had a question come in, uh, which I'll read out. Hi, my son is nearly two years old. The teeth in his cleft line have come through vertically rather than horizontally, if that makes sense. There are two teeth in the space where there should be one. I sent some photos to my son's surgeon and they have said that they want to leave it for a while, but our dentist has expressed concerns about the impact it may have on his adult teeth. What should I do? This is quite a common, I have seen this before, it is quite common, especially around the cleft area where the cleft is that teeth don't are not necessarily in a line. But in, in someone of two, there isn't anything that we would do actively at the moment. So the surgeon's right. The important thing is everything's kept clean. So it's all about advice and cleaning in that area. I'm sure Rhiannon will reiterate what I'm saying. It's the access, um, because if you do get plaque and food that stagnates there, those teeth can become decayed. And we do sometimes see that because it's, it's quite difficult to access those areas. So again, it's showing parents, it's showing where, you know, where these teeth are, where we get the brush in. But in terms of the alignment, I wouldn't worry about that at this stage. This is something that, you know, as they get older and into their adult teeth, and I'm sure Matt will discuss later, that's something that'll be looked in. But in the early stages, it's really about keeping the teeth clean um, and not worrying about the alignment as such and seeing the dentist regularly. I don't think Rhiannon said anything else you'd want to add to that, but. No, no, I agree completely. What one thing Mina had said about is, is access to some of the teeth can be difficult with a normal toothbrush. So we would normally recommend staying with fairly small, maybe only two centimetres of bristles, that can help. But also they do make very small toothbrushes. So single tufted toothbrushes, you can find them easily on the internet. And actually for some children, the scar tissue means that they don't have a lot of free movement in their lips. So they may feel as if they go in as far as they can, but it's actually useful to teach the child to feel comfortable enough to hold the lift Definitely. up and out of the way. And then these little single tufted brushes will get into the sort of more awkward nooks and crannies. But you, you can definitely find them perhaps more difficult in supermarkets but online. We, we have samples of these that we give out in our clinic, so we're quite lucky. Um, but it is all about lift the lip, which, which we do so very early on and get access. You both. Um, I'll follow up with another question. Um, so these next questions are they were quite similar. So I'm going to group them together. Um, firstly, how do I get my daughter seen by a dentist? She was seen at three months, but nothing since. She's now eight months. Next part to that is how do we find an NHS dentist? My child was seen at the hospital at three months, but nothing since. And finally, please give advice on dentists refusing to take NHS children with cleft. Some people may be able to afford private care, but not everyone can. Um, we're not sure if it's a question the whole panel being yeah. but um, you know, 
should free dentistry be easier to access for children with clefts? Um, panel, if you need me to repeat any parts of that question, I will do. <laughs> I mean, shall I start? I mean, absolutely. This is a massive challenge and, and I'm seeing this daily on clinic. Um, and it's been it's, since COVID, I think it's become even worse. I'm talking about England because um, I work in London and the situation there. Um, and access is, is a massive issue at the moment. Um, we, I do see a lot of them. I'm quite fortunate that we, they do end up coming to see me, but it's not ideal. I've got, um, I cover the South East um, and their patients traveling all the way from Sussex, which is, you know, a couple of hours away coming to see me for dental checkups because they cannot find a local dentist at the moment. My advice is that to all of them is to try NHS 111 if, because they will, they can give advice. Um, most, or as I said, clef, depending where they are, I don't know where this, this patient, this, this particular person um, is from in the country. But as I said before, we do have a paediatric dentist as part of most of the CLEF services. So if there is um, an issue with access, they do contact us and we can signpost them. We do have links with commu local community dental services, which are kind of um, us, but within the community. Um, so and they are, tend to have more time and they're more, they're, they're, special, but they're specialists. So able to deal and treat children with, you know, with, with clutter from palate, uh, where local dentists may not, you know, be happy to do it. But again, they've got long waiting lists as well. But I think what I would say is first port of call is speak to your cleft unit and find out who the dentist there and see if they can signpost you. We've got NHS 111. Um, in my in my personal experience, in my my patch, I do I have been fortunate. I do see them. Um, but it is, as I said, you know, they're traveling a long way and it's a burden for them to come. Um, I don't have the answers regarding funding and, you know, the, the NHS and what's happening with NHS dentistry. I mean, there are challenges there. I'm not here to blame anybody. Um, what we want to do is do our best for our patients. So that would be my advice. And I'm, I'm talking about England. Um, I don't know what this, the situation is um, UK wide, but my understanding is having been to national meetings, it's a similar situation, just trying to access dentists sometimes what I do is I write to them so if patients come to me and they've registered they've got other kids registered the dentist but they're not accepting the child with a cleft and palate I write a letter to them expect you know explaining um you know why it's important and what I'd like them to do and you know in terms of regular reviews and placing fluoride paint on the teeth and put the department of health you know we cut and paste the, the guidelines into it so we do help where we can um, but it's it's difficult it's challenging and Honestly, Rhiannon or Matt, if you've got anything else to add to that, but it's, I, yeah, it's. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you've said. Um, I have given the panel links, depending on what country you're in, so they, it will go on the chat. So it is slightly different in England to Wales to Scotland to Northern Ireland. Some of them are websites where you put your postcode in and, it, um, and others like Northern Ireland, you have to actively search a mm. dentist but they may not always be nhs dentists it could also just be a list of dentists in your area honestly if you have a spare afternoon on a sunday when it's raining just email every single one of them and tell them that you want to be on their waiting list so you do need to take some sort of I, i'm not saying people don't but real get forward with it and get yourself on every single list but there is inherently a big issue and um, one of my other roles is i'm president-elect for the british society for dental hygiene and therapy and that allows me to go to all these higher level meetings and raise this at every opportunity and one of the things in the, the government's workforce plan is looking at using the skill mix a little better so it might be in the future your child might see a dental therapist first and that just gets them in through the door because we're able to do most childhood dentistry treatment plan treat within what we're able to do and anything that's outside of that or specialist we refer on but that at least gets you in through the door and then a referral possibly to your team. CLAPA website has a really good page on it, which shows you whatever area you live in, where your regional team is. So that will give you a contact detail to your regional team. Obviously, it's nicer if we get a referral from a dentist that's explaining everything, maybe with the radiographs, a bit of background. But actually, some will take a self-referral. So as a parent or a young adult, an adult, you can phone up and ask to be seen. But the more information you give, the better. But I would also manage people's expectations that I, look, I work one day a week the last 15 years I can't see everybody so it, it generally is screened as a something that's considered to be cleft related so if you have gum disease you've got gum disease that can be treated anywhere it might be more complex around the site of your cleft and that might be where you get 
the sort of special input from from us but it's not a problem that's going to go away anytime soon and as unpopular as my next comment is going to be there are hundreds of private dentists in your area and although you can put the argument aside of why we should be able to get NHS dentistry at the moment the system isn't working as well as it could that is always an option and actually I think people's assumption that private dentistry is extremely expensive is sometimes not warranted so it is again still worth looking around the different practices and just asking them how much is it for a checkup how much is it for a set of radiographs how much would it be to see a hygiene mm. hygienist and actually you might I work privately but I don't charge much at all it's not much different you know so it's, it is worth although it rates a bit to have to it is yeah. worth actually looking at private dentistry as a possible option just to be seen once and be told what's wrong and what's needed and get your referral into the test mm. And just to add to that, um, I'm part of the British Society of Paediatric Dentistry, which is another a society where it's a de paediatric dentist across the country, all the devolved nations meet. We just had our conference, actually, and something that um, we've been pushing that's actually now a government initiative, something called Dental Check by One. All dentists know about it. It's that, that we want every child to ideally be registered with a dentist by the age of one um, to have a, a dental assessment. So dentists are aware of it. And actually, it is dependent on where you are, but there are, you know, practices that are taking patients on as a result of this initiative. But as Rhiannon says, it, it does vary. Unfortunately, it is a bit of a, a postcode lottery at the moment. Definitely in, where in my patch, there's certain patches where we have what we call dental deserts. You know, just they're just we just can't. And we're actually doing a piece of work as a group of paediatric consultants are doing some um, research work, a multi-centre, um, looking at giving questionnaires out to cleft patients to get an idea of what's happening nationally, um, because we do want to get a bit of picture of this and then take it forward. So we are also looking at this um, from our perspective, because if we can get the data um, and then, you know, push this forward and say, look, these are areas that are really lacking. We need to be, you know, putting resources in these areas. But um, yeah, I mean, as I said, as Rena said, there are good private dentists who will take on um, patients, but obviously it does depend on affordability and things. So I do say it, it, it is challenging at the moment. Of course. Well, thank you for that. That's a lot of information there. Definitely helpful. Um, we've had a question in through Facebook Live. Uh, so here I go. My son had a gum notch. Uh, is he likely to get teeth through on that part? He's only one. It depends. He might do. Um, it depends if he's gum notches. Sometimes, as I said, with children cleft lip and palate, they're prone to bit, they are prone to missing teeth or extra teeth. And within the gum notch, you find sometimes the teeth do come through, but they come through later. Um, sometimes, and, and as before, they come through and they're quite difficult to access. They might about you know accessing it and identifying it. Sometimes they don't come through. Um, so it does vary, but as I've said, it's all, always about keeping an eye, um, brushing the area, brushing around the notch, because the notch itself can be a portal for, you know, um, food and plaque to accumulate. So, and that can make that area inflamed. So again, you know, even though there's not a tooth in that notch area, do keep that area clean. Um, so yeah, so it, it does vary from patient to patient. I can't say there's sort of, a, you know, one size fits all. It does vary. Sometimes they, they do erupt, sometimes they don't. Right, thank you. And the next question that we have on our list here is what's the best toothbrush and toothpaste you'd recommend for cleft children who have hard to reach extra hidden teeth high up in the cleft, cleft gap, uh, etc., who don't like electric toothbrushes or foaming um, minty toothpaste? Shall I start first, Rhiannon? So I think you're probably, you know, just from my experience, but I'm sure Rhiannon's, um, you know, not all. Um, I don't know if any of you've heard of the toothpaste or a nurse. Um, it's a flavourless toothpaste because um, I have a lot, I do have a lot of children with um, not only with the, the clap, clap and palace surface, but I also work with children with um, um, neuro neurodiversity, so autism, autism support, autistic spectrum, um, where um, they have oral aversions and they find that the toothpaste and the, is very strong and they don't like the foaming. But Oranus, is, it, it's, it's been a game changer for me. It's literally a flavourless toothpaste. So if someone's put that on the chat, fantastic. Um, the company's brilliant. I have samples I give out to patients. 
but it's flavorless, non-foaming, but it actually has the correct amount of fluoride. I've tried it. If you like mint, it tastes so strange. It's not very nice, but the, the, for people that don't like the mint, this is brilliant. So that would be the toothpaste I would recommend. You can buy it now in, in supermarkets or online. Um, 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 and I don't know, it's slightly more expensive than um, the other toothpaste on the market, but it's so worth it. So I'd recommend that. In terms of toothbrushes, um, I, especially in the cleft area, I still like those baby brushes. I know there's certain that they like the really flexible baby, the 0 to 2 brushes at certain, I know all the brands do them and we, we have them in our unit. They're flexible and they're very easy to get into these hard to reach areas. And I say that to all children, even they, you know, they have their usual toothbrush that they use, um, but that one for that area, I think is, it, it really does help. Um, especially if they find those bigger ones are a bit bulky and it is hard to get into those areas. So that's what I recommend. Um, in terms of toothbrushes, people also ask what's better, electric or manual? There isn't anything to say that one's better than the other. What I say to is what, you know, they're brushing morning and, and night and, and they use something that, you know, if, if electric works for them, but as long as they're still brushing in the right areas, it doesn't completely do the work for you. Um, but if a manual works, a manual works. There's no real sort of um, evidence one way or the other. Um, if they are going to use an electric one, the ones with the oscillating heads um, tend to be better um, performing. Um, but I'm sure Rhiannon will also say it's, it's really down to technique and, and, and brushing in the right areas at the right time. Yeah, absolutely agree. Again, with everything you said, I'm in a very agreeable mood. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But again, again, I would go back to what I was saying earlier about, it. again, a small toothbrush, sort of child size and replacing them regularly as well. If the bristles start to splay, they won't be working very well or the very small single tufted. I think, you know, for us, it's difficult to understand if we haven't had a cleft ourselves. Children who haven't had a, an alveolar bone graft to actually still have a patent cleft. It would be the same as us taking Colgate toothpaste and sticking it up our nose. It, yeah. it wouldn't it wouldn't be nice. So what we're brushing around that cleft site and pushing minty toothpaste up into their nose. Even if they don't mind mint, they're definitely not going to want it in their nose and it's hard to clear. So that, that's possibly a way to think about why it's kinder to use a, a, a milder toothpaste as long as it has the right amount of fluoride. Um, but also it can be a little bit sore. Now, normally as a dental hygienist, I'd be telling people to be very brave around the gums. And I would say that everywhere else in the mouth, but around a cleft site, occasionally the, just the nature of what tissue was left the surgeons had to work with it is a little bit more sometimes a bit more like tissue on the inside of your lip than the gum so more like the sensitivity you'd feel on the back of your hand than the difference of how that would be on the palm of your hand so it's tissue that it wasn't meant it wasn't designed to be able to sort of take that kind of pressure so actually when your child flinches it could be that it's genuinely a little bit more uncomfortable so it's just being thorough but gentle. And, that, and I think that's why sometimes the little tiny toothbrushes really help. Um, the other supermarkets, chemists, little purple tablets. Um, you probably only need half of one actually for a young child. Make it fun, make everybody do it. Mum, dad, Kira, whoever it is, granny, make everybody do it. But what it does, you, you chew the tablet up, run it around your mouth, have one rinse of water, and spit it out and it won't it doesn't have any flavor so it won't affect a cleft even if it does come out of their nose um in fact pur purple coming out their nose might be amusing for them but then when you look in the mirror together afterwards it will it will show up any areas you've missed but that helps to highlight to the child why you're being so careful around an area and why they need to lift their lip up so they're called disclosing tablets and they're widely available um and and obviously the ingredients are on the back if your child has any allergies at all Great, thank you for that, Ellie. Uh, back to you. Thanks, Dev. Uh, next question goes as my son was born with a cleft lip and palate on the left side. Sometimes I'm a bit worried about the mouth hygiene because he is on formula milk and I can see leftovers of the formula milk in his mouth. When he throws it up, it comes from the nose as well. How can I clean his mouth after each feed? I am worried what the leftover formula milk will do to his cleft palate and lip. Do I need to give him water? He is three months old now and he's going to have his first surgery by the end of this month, 28th of September. Do you want to start this for me, Rhiannon? And then I'll follow. 
Okay, yeah, uh, thank you for submitting this because we don't have a cleft nurse in the meeting this mm -hmm. evening, but by submitting in ahead, we were able to actually ask. So I talked to a colleague. It, it does vary a little bit in the region that you're in, but her advice was certainly to contact your local cleft team and ask the advice of a nurse. They usually have a, a, a team of nurses that cover full time, even up sometimes on the weekends for things as well. So this is something they'd be very happy to help you with. Ordinarily, it probably won't cause much of an issue if your baby seems very happy after you've fed. Uh, but if they're still awake at the end of the feed and you want to offer them a bottle of it, so it would be cooled boiled water. So water you had previously boiled that you've let be, it isn't going to make a tremendous amount of difference after the surgery because with any luck, it'll be a little bit less likely to come up, up through the nose. Um, but that that was what we were recommending in our own cleft team is that you would contact your own local cleft team and ask this nursing every cleft centre has a team of them. So that that was all I wanted to. Yeah, that exactly the same. Um, we've had when we had clinics and some even some of the older patients are still not getting things through their nose. And when they come at 18 months, I do advise them to speak to the, the cleft team and, the, you know, the nurses and the surgeons. Um, but as as Rhiannon said, you know, just as best as we can, keep the area as clean as we can. But sometimes there are further things that need to be dealt with by the other members of the team. But yeah. Yeah, and best of luck for the surgery next week as well. Yes, You're in good exactly. Hands. Good luck with that. Great. And the next question, and uh, the last one on paediatric uh, dentistry. So is there a link between cleft lips and delayed teething? At what point should I be concerned about my baby not teething? That's a different one. In general, we do say, as I said at the beginning, children with cleft lip and palate, you know, and they're, the, the, when the teeth are up, the pattern of eruption is different. It is slightly different. It can be delayed, and we do advise them of that. So um, we try to reassure them. And again, as I said before, try not to compare with a child who, without a cleft, you know, who is non cleft, because things do happen. And even within children in general, even without cleft and palate, my daughter, she got her first tooth so late. Um, and it, it just, you know, just because she did, and she's getting her second teeth quite late as well. It's, there's a lot, it's multifactorial. So I wouldn't worry too much. As I said, you know, regular dentists, and if you've got, if you are worried, they, you know, speak to your dentist within the cleft unit and get them to see you. Um, but my advice is, you know, it, don't, at this particular stage, don't worry. Um, and just keep, just the, the, the key is see a local dentist, um, you know, try and keep the mouth clean, and if they if they if it is delayed, very delayed, you are concerned. Obviously, speak to one of us, um, and we can advise you. But usually, there are it, it, there is a chance it will be delayed, and the pattern will be different. Um, so that would be my advice. So I don't, I don't know if I want to say anything else, but it's that's what it is. Um, but thank you for that question. Brianna, is there anything else you want to add to that, or no? Okay, great, perfect. I'll like pass you back over to Annie. Thanks, Sav. So that concludes all the questions we had around paediatric dentistry for now. Um, if anybody does have any feedback they'd like to provide, we'd be really, really grateful. Um, and there will be a link to this in the chat where you can feedback. Um, next, we're so pleased to welcome along a couple of our young people from our Children and Young People's Council who are going to be sharing their own stories. Thank you so much for joining both of you. Firstly, um, I'll hand over to Grace. Uh, hello. Um, luckily, uh, with um, my teeth, it's been pretty uh, good. But uh, for starters, with my teeth, I um, had to get some out to help my adult ones uh, start to come down. After that, we had a slight gap and then they uh, started to fit a um, metal piece in the top of uh, my, uh, my palette there. Uh, it was uh, slightly painful at first, but it eventually got used to it and then I didn't notice that. Uh, but after so after I uh, got my braces and it helped quite a bit because uh, it widened my palette 
to help my teeth. Um, so when I first got my braces, uh, it was uh, quite uncomfortable. So I just used one of those really small little toothbrushes to help there. Um, other than that, uh, sorry. Um, after I uh that's all done, I might be having a a uh operation on my jaw to help uh my teeth where my bite is uh goes that way. Um, after that, I'll have bottom uh braces on my bottom teeth, and once that's all done, I might need a retainer. Oh, thanks so much, Grace. Was superstar. Really good to hear your story. Um, thank you for taking the time to join us as well. And uh, next, I'll hand over to Alana. Hello. Um, I'm Alana. I'm 16 years old, so I'm a bit further along on my journey. Um, I had not a rocky start, but it's been a bit more more difficult than I would have liked um, but luckily I've had the same orthodontics ever since I was six months old I think so that's been really nice because he's always been friendly he's always been supportive he talks to me like I'm just like a friend in a way which helps um, which I know sometimes with dentists and stuff like that they don't always know about cleft or they're sometimes a bit like rude because they're like oh I don't know how to be uh friendly but most people can be really friendly um which I've always appreciated um I've had 16 teeth removed um because I've had a what's it called I've had double teeth in like a double row um which has been difficult at most times, but it means I get more money from the tooth fairy. Um, so that's always a bonus. Um, I have, yeah, I've had braces, which were meant to happen for just one year, but because it kept breaking, it had to be for two years, um, which could be, it was really annoying because I was like, I just want to get it over and done with. I just want to get my perfect teeth where they're all straight, but it's worth it in the end. Um, what else have I had? Uh, with the teeth, they have been very like painful, like afterwards, because your mouth's just getting used to the anaesthetic wearing off. Um, but I've always been bribed with sweet treats instead of soup because they always help um, relax myself because ice cream, you know, um, <laughs> who wants soup when you can get ice cream and jelly? Um, but yeah, I still have quite a lot. I've got a few things more to do, so I've still got um gaps in my mouth so I've got a retainer at the moment but I'm gonna get braces again um so I've still got a long way but I can see the light at the end of the tunnel which you soon will so, yeah that's about it <laughs> oh brilliant thanks Alana um had us all chuckling there it's been great to have you both with us thank you Grace thank you Alana um for sharing your personal experiences uh staff do you want to introduce our next section yeah, of course. Thank you, girls. That was absolutely um, amazing. And honestly, it took me back, actually, to, to my own uh, restorative process. So, yeah, I, all I can say is keep going. Trust me, you'll get there at the end of the tunnel. Um, OK, so we're going to be moving on with the questions now. And the rest of our questions will now be focusing on adult dentistry. Um, if you're an adult and missed out on the opportunity to ask a question, please do be sure to fill out our online survey at clapper.com forward slash survey, where you can sh share your concerns with Clapper, who are using this data to find out what the biggest needs are of the Clapper community. So I'm going to hand it over to Annie for the first question. Yeah, it's uh, it's quite a long one. So if anybody needs any parts repeating, just let me know. Um, my 17-year-old son has had the teeth around his cleft made up as they were smaller. 
He was also more recently diagnosed with a nasal nasopharyngeal carcinoma and has had radiation to his head and neck area, which I understand could also make his teeth weaker. He has just in the last week noticed that his tooth in that area seems to have chipped and typically we've just been informed that the dentists are going private and I'm just wondering where we go from here. Is he likely to need lots of dentistry work moving forward due to his cleft making teeth weaker and the radiation? Is it something that is co covered by the hospital because of his history? Or do we just need to pay the private prizes and realise it may cost, cost us a small fortune moving forwards? Uh, shall I take that question? Um, first of all, uh, I'm very sorry to hear the diagnosis that your, your son has had at such a young age as well. And nasopharyngeal carcinoma is, is not a common carcinoma by any means and really not common in someone of, of such a young age. Um, and, and now, of course, your son straddles two, two specialties, two areas. We have the cleft lip and palate issues, and we also have the, the, the carcinoma issue. Um, I don't know what medical team will have dealt with the carcinoma, whether it was perhaps ENT, ear, nose and throat, or maybe the maxillofacial department. But of course, the cleft lip and palate team would have had involvement with him as well. So when you, when you ask the question as to would treatment be free or who might be able to do that treatment i i can say quite categorically in this instance there would be someone working in the hospital dental specialties who would want to help look after him help his dentition most certainly um and that could either begin by uh, by being seen through the maxillofacial team or indeed a direct referral to the cleft lip and palate team uh, because they would be uh, dental clinicians on that team who would help look after the dentition now, you, your son will absolutely be able to look after his dentition, but he is more prone to having certain dental diseases. So we turn on to the subject now of, of the radiotherapy treatment that he's had. Unfortunately, radiotherapy, it does affect your gums and your teeth. Um, in particular, it affects your saliva production. I know Mina talked a lot about saliva a little earlier on this evening. Saliva bathes our teeth and our gums and protects them. And if you are unfortunate enough to have had radiotherapy treatment, you then tend not to produce as much saliva as the next person. So you, your teeth are at greater risk of gum disease and tooth decay. So meticulous levels of oral hygiene are critical, but also seeing the dental team is critical for regular checkups and to stay on top of things. If you if you were to start developing some dental disease, you want to treat it quickly because it's more easy to undertake that treatment if you have it done um, before it becomes more complex. So in this case, I, I would say absolutely get in contact with the cleft lip and palate team that is associated with your geography, where it is that you live. If you don't know that, go back to the surgery team, either the maxillofacial or the ENT team, and they can do a referral into the cleft service as well. But there's no doubt about it, your son could have and would benefit from help from the, the hospital dental services. I hope I've answered all parts of that question because there were lots of parts. Have I covered everything? I'm just looking back through now, Matt. Um, there was a, a sort of sub part of the question that read, uh, your man's actually, it just in the last week noticed that his tooth in, in that area seems to have chipped. And the teeth, dental, yes. yeah, the dental practice yes. has just gone private. So where do they go yes. from here? Yes, okay. Um, so. Chip teeth, you can get chip teeth for a variety of different reasons. It doesn't necessarily have to be because you're a cleft patient or you've had radiotherapy, but it could be the early signs of some problems with teeth, some weakening of the teeth because of the treatment that's happening. So again, a dentist getting in there early and having a look as to why the teeth have chipped and then to fix them and stop it getting worse would certainly be important. And, and, and then we come back to the issue of do we have to pay for lots of expensive private dental treatment? Well, I would say this is a very particular case where absolutely the hospital dental services could, can help. Thanks, Matt. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh, and on to the next question. I am an adult with a bilateral cleft lip and I have 
caused my teeth to rot quite badly. I've had most of my teeth removed and I'm struggling to get a denture to fit properly. Is this common for people with clefts? Okay, so I think the immediate answer is yes, it, it, it is common. Um, the issue of, of being pregnant can accelerate some dental diseases, in particular uh, gum disease issues. Um, so I wonder then after your pregnancy, whether you went through a process of having teeth that couldn't be fixed and then got extracted. And if you're in the situation now where you've got lots of missing teeth, dentures are always a little bit more difficult to construct in that instance, cleft or otherwise. But if you've got a cleft, it just adds to that level of complexity. Sometimes it can be hard to get the dentures to fit snugly and to have a watertight fit around the cleft zone. Um, I would say that um, um, dental practices, dentists working in those practices would absolutely be able to try and construct you a denture, but then they might fail. Okay? And then they might realize themselves, that maybe this case was a little too difficult, a little complex. They might want some help from someone that works in the cleft services within a hospital environment. So I would say if, if you're in a position where the dentist has already tried and, and everyone can see that it's not working out as well as, as uh, we would wish it to, then quite possibly a referral into the cleft services in wherever your local cleft services um, might be a benefit. Um, I, I certainly see people with those issues and I'll go through a process of constructing dentures. We have some alternative techniques, maybe some specialist techniques that we might use to try and get a better end result. But it's, but it's, it's certainly common, that does happen. Thanks, Matt. Okay. Um, I'll move on with our next question. I'm an older person and I'm having problems with a referral to the cleft team. I also can't find an NHS dentist. I'm worried about the effect this will have on my speech if my existing teeth are not maintained, as my receding gums and aging appear to be taking their toll. Is there any advice you can give on this? Would be welcome, please. I've been in an NHS void for three years with no referral to maxillofacial team being sorted or a resolution provided. Thanks for any advice. Okay. Okay, so perhaps I should start answering this question by saying, so I, I work in uh, the cleft team in a hospital in Swansea in South Wales as part of the South Wales cleft lip and palate team. Um, and we have we have certain rules and regulations on, on how patients come and visit us and have treatment with us. Uh, I would imagine those rules and regulations are very similar for all the cleft groups within the UK. I think, I think there are 17 um, um, areas where, where cleft treatment is provided throughout the UK. Um, uh, and, and I would say at this point that, yes, you're going to struggle to find an NHS dentist. We covered that as a, 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 a the first part of the evening. Um, and absolutely, a referral into a CLEF team would be a benefit to you now to see where you are, to see what's happening with your dentition, to see if things can be done to halt the progression of, I think you mentioned um, gum recession and, and receding gums, and maybe you feel your dentition is, is going downhill somewhat. Um, so a referral into the cleft team for someone to check on that would be a benefit. Of course, if you've not got a dentist and you've not had a dentist for three years, you will ask the question, how do I get referred into the cleft lip and palate team? There are two methods that I'm aware of that would certainly be successful in the Wales region. So I specifically, but I'm, I'm sure it applies elsewhere in the You can ask your... to provide a written referral into wherever your local cleft team is. That is one route. It's not used commonly, but it would be successful. Secondly, and I am be, being very South Wales specific now, we have a web page with email addresses and telephone numbers. And if you are a cleft palate patient that is struggling with a certain dental condition, you can contact our hospital and they would arrange some form of communication or potentially to come in for a consultation to find out what's going on. That, that most certainly would work in the, in the Southern Wales region. I'm sure it would apply elsewhere as well. Um, this is a multi-part question again. I'm, I'm not quite sure what else I was supposed to answer there. So we did the access. Uh, oh, oh, we mentioned speech. I think the person mentioned speech. They can say that their speech might go downhill if they struggle with more dental problems. It, it's fair to say that uh, uh, your dentition 
plays a significant part in in how you speak and the, and, and the, the sounds of your speech. So yes, if you were about to very much struggle with your front teeth, then that's going dentistry can be done to either uh, uh, help your front teeth, save your front teeth, or if you'd gone so far as where you are about to lose teeth, then of course, and if people have been unfortunate enough to lose a number of teeth, they can be replaced in a variety of different manners so they can stabilize you know, your, your speech and your ability to talk and communicate. Have I answered everything in that question? Um, I think so. There's just one outstanding part around a referral to a, a maxillofacial team. I guess the maxillofacial team is not really the team that that person needs to go and see. They need to go and see the cleft palate team. I, I, I accept that actually the maxillofacial and the cleft team, they're often working exactly the same department, often using the same the same rooms, the same facilities, but it's but it's the cleft team specifically that they really need to see. Um, I su I suspect if your referral ended up with a maxillofacial team, they would just pass it along the corridor to the cleft team. Right. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. So this question is more regarding orthodontics. Um, so not to worry if you're unable to answer this one, um, but how long does it usually take to get a referral when wait, when wanting to get orthodontic treatment for major jaw surgery? Okay, so I'm not an orthodontist, but I work with the orthodontist all the time. I've, I've got part of an answer there. There, there. there are several stages in the referral process before you end up having your braces and potentially surgery, I think this person mentioned. So so the first thing is you, you get referred in for your initial consultation to find out, do you need braces? Um, and then that specialist would work out if you do need braces, do those braces have to be applied in a hospital setting or can they be done in a practice setting away from the hospital? So if you're complex enough and quite often a cleft patient will be complex enough, it might mean that your braces have to happen in the hospital environment. And then that, that's, there is a waiting list for that then. So you'll be put on that waiting list. And when you come to it, it varies an awful lot. I'm sure it varies from hospital to hospital, institution to institution. It also varies depending on, on the, the patient themselves as to how old they are. So some children might start their braces treatment as, as early as maybe 10 or 11 years old. It might actually be left until you are much later into your teen years. So it does depend. But most certainly, once you're on the list to have braces in a hospital environment, there is a wait. So I can only give you um, some examples from, from hospital in Swansea where I work. The wait to actually have your braces applied is long. It is considerably more than a year, if not closer to 18 months. So it's a long period of time before your braces will actually be applied to your teeth. And if you did fall into that category of someone who needs braces and some form of jaw surgery, that wait could be even longer still because you're going to go through several different processes. Okay. I don't know if anybody else has got any commentary. Applied. Yeah, I think that seems to be the same thing across the country. Um, and certainly in our unit, that, that what I was thinking of is what is in your control as a patient. If you have waited a really long time and then you go and see the orthodontist and your oral hygiene isn't very good, you won't start the treatment. So you will either be sent back to your dentist or maybe sent to see someone like myself. And until your oral hygiene is optimal, you can't begin that journey. So that is something that actually is modifiable and something in your control. Again, it doesn't matter whether you're a child, the disclosing tablets are incredibly helpful for showing you areas that you might be struggling. And like Mina said earlier, the only evidence that suggests an electric toothbrush is better is when you're wearing braces, but coming up to it, if you're struggling with a manual toothbrush, it is worth looking at an electric toothbrush and you don't have to spend a lot of money on them. To, to get a reasonably good one but it's just it would be a terrible shame if you waited all that time and then got told you weren't dentally fit enough and then it delayed it even more and the same with surgery as well jaw surgery isn't normally done until a child has stopped growing because you don't want the child to continue to grow so we need to know you stop growing which can also lengthen the time you're waiting 
but the same again no surgeon wants to operate in someone's mouth that isn't very clean so they will again hold back for sensible reasons the, the commencement of that treatment if your oral hygiene isn't good enough so is that just something to consider that is within your control Thanks, Rhiannon. And you might be able to help us to answer this next question, please. Um, I don't have an idea on age, um, but my son has just had a buccinator flap repair done and we are struggling to brush his teeth. Can you recommend a specific technique? He has agreed to allow us to brush his front teeth, but won't let us brush the back. Is there a mouthwash we could use? Oh, sorry. Uh, his age is five. Uh, thank, thank you. This is a very specific one, and I understand that it doesn't, it won't set up necessarily be relevant to other people. In and it's where they move big, big parts of the inside of the patient's cheek towards the back of the throat, usually to help with swallowing speech and, and things like that. It's becoming a more common procedure. But actually, the reason I wanted to answer this one is it doesn't really make much difference what operation you've had in your mouth. It can be difficult to encourage a child to clean afterwards because it's sore. <laughs> Um, they're obviously very protective. It's understandable that he's allowing you to brush the front teeth because they weren't affected by the operation. But what you've got here is um, effectively a wound that's healing in the cheek where they've taken the tissue from and the wound at the back. It won't like having minty toothpaste on it. If anything, go for Aura Nurse or a flavor free toothpaste or even just for a day or two, no toothpaste. And what you can do to make a normal toothbrush even softer is just run it under the warm tap in your bathroom and just keep running under there until the bristles get softer. And, and and try sort of starting near the gum. You don't want to be moving the toothbrush around because the back of it's going to actually be touching the sutures that, that the your child has in their mouth. And five is a very difficult age to rationalize and ex explain something. So it's approaching very, very slowly. And, and it might even be letting them do it very, very gently um, for a while. Mouthwash is a tricky one. At age five, I would say no. There isn't really a mouthwash out there that we recommend or prescribe anymore that, that we use, particularly post-op but actually very useful for rinsing with just warm water after any meal. Just encourage the child to sort of swish it around and swallow it as best they can, just to loosen any food um, in that sense. But it was more that I wanted to answer that one, not specifically just for the buckle flap surgery, but for any surgery in the mouth. Cleaning afterwards is so important, but it does have to be adapted and, and consideration has to be made for the fact that it is very, very uncomfortable. It would be fine to not use toothpaste for a day or two just to see if that, that would allow him to clean around the mouth a bit more without without the discomfort. Was there anything you would add to that? Um, I was gonna, one more thing, I'm, I'm going, but you mentioned something about mouthwash, which I know people ask. Generally, the guidance is usually eight and above because we don't want them swallowing. Uh, although I know some children do use mouthwash earlier, um, we tend not to advocate it so early on because we do worry about them swallowing it. Um, and if they are going to use a mouthwash, um, above eight, there are some, it's alcohol free and there are lots of different um, ranges of um, using a mouthwash. But if you are using a mouthwash, make sure you're not using it straight after you brush your teeth. The reason is if you brush your teeth and then you rinse with the mouthwash, you're washing off that toothpaste and you want that toothpaste to have a, prevent, a, a preventive effect on the teeth because the fluoride, you want to keep it on the teeth, not wash it off. So what I tend to say is, um, you know, brush your teeth and use a mouthwash at a different time. So you're getting the fluoride at a different times so after lunch and after dinner. So I just wanted to add that and just say goodbye everyone. And thank you very much. Thanks so much, Mina. I really appreciate you joining. Um, just further to that as well, if, if there are any other questions about pediatric, pediatric dentistry anybody's got, please do still submit them and we can email those on to Mina. Very kind offer. Thank you so much. Um, I will move on to our next question then. Um, is it possible to have dentures fitted if there is a hole in the palate? My dentist a few years ago told me it's not possible. It absolutely is. In fact, one of the methods for curing a hole in the palate is to make someone a denture. Um, I, I, so I'd imagine, yeah, but maybe the dentist is, is not comfortable, not happy constructing that type of denture. Um, so again, a referral into your cleft and palate team would be a benefit because there would be someone there that can, could construct that type of denture. Uh, one reason why, why dentists might be a little unsure or not keen on constructing a denture is 
for anyone who's gone through that process before, you will know that you have to have molds or impressions taken of your mouth. And if you do have a hole in the palate, dentists worry about where the impression material is going to go because we don't want too much of it going through the hole in the palate. So you, you, it, it requires a little bit of care and attention and maybe slightly different techniques to make sure we don't lose impression material in the hole that's in the palate. So that might be uh, why dentists have been reluctant in the past, but, but certainly as part of a cleft lip and palate team, there would be a dentist um, with a special interest in treating such patients. And yes, you can have a denture that helps plug the hole you've got in the palate. Brilliant. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Um, okay, next question. The, these two are very similar, so I'm going to ask them together. Uh, so bear with me. Um, firstly, can I access free dental treatment in relation to my affected teeth? And following on from that, uh, I currently have a denture that fits my upper gums. I now only have two teeth on my left side, and it makes my current denture loose and fall out. I was wondering if the NHS will pay for a new denture or implants, and I blame my cleft for the tooth loss. Okay, um, so the first question was about accessing free dental care for the, the, the cleft affected teeth. Very similar to the conversations we, we've had thus far this evening already. Um, so if you're able to obtain an NHS dentist, um, they would be able to do treatment for you, assuming it wasn't too complex and they felt that it was beyond their remit. Um, now, there are, uh, I, I am not an expert on NHS dental fees. Uh, however, I am aware that there are certain categories of adults that are allowed to have free dental treatment. There are other categories of adults that are not allowed to have free dental treatment. Having a cleft per se does not necessarily allow you to have free dental treatment in a dental practice. And then following on from that, if your dental situation is complex enough that it requires a referral to the hospital dental services, any treatment you have done in those services is then free. And so I think that covers the first question. And the second question was a bit more specific about types of dental treatment. The person's got, I think, two teeth left. Yeah, so that's certainly correct. If you're in a situation where you've only got two teeth left in your jaw, top jaw or bottom jaw, then mating successful replacement teeth does become more difficult. Uh, generally speaking, we are now talking about a solution that is a denture, so something that is removable that comes in, in and out of your mouth, but those dentures may then not be retained particularly well because they haven't got many teeth to cling on to. So sometimes we start to think about other ways of trying to hold teeth in the mouth. And I think the person mentioned the concept of dental implants. So dental implants are a very complicated way of giving people their teeth back. Um, they can actually give you fixed teeth or dental implants can be used to hold a denture in place. Again, it depends on your dental circumstances. Um, I'm sure most people know that have investigated dental implants. They are done through private practice arenas. So an NHS dentist working practice would not supply you with dental implants. Private practitioners can and would. You have to obviously find someone that, that does that type of treatment, but there would be a cost associated with it. Moving back into the hospital service, so, so I see a complex cleft lip and palate patients, and some of them sometimes require a dental implant to solve their tooth-related problem. And then if I do it in my environment, there is no cost to the patient. But I must point out they are very specific cleft lip and palate patients with a very specific problem that, that can't be solved in any other way. And then we have to go forward with dental implant. I hope that answers um, that question. I think, yeah, I think it does. But I just think at the end, um, they're wondering if the NHS will pay for the new dentra um, or not. Okay, okay. So, so the answer there is encompassed by, by whether you are a person that uh, is, is entitled to free dental treatment. Okay, so, so there might be something about your circumstances that allow you to have free dental treatment, in which case dental treatment is free. But dental implant treatment, that, that's not about to be free unless it has to be provided in a hospital dental service. Okay, there, are, um, there, are, there are categories say, of adult 
that are allowed to have free dentistry, but I, I couldn't possibly list them all. Um, it's quite easy to get that information. You, know, you can do a Google or NHS dental search and it'll tell you who is entitled to free dental treatment. Okay, thank you so much for answering that. And uh, back over to you, Annie, for the next question. Yeah, we've uh, just had one come in on the Facebook chat. Um, hello, I'm 53 and have recently had to have my front tooth removed. I asked my dentist to refer me back to a cleft team before removal, and he got back to me saying the cleft team won't see me as it's my front tooth. I'd like to come back to see if an implant would be possible. Do you know if I can? Okay, so, okay. Um, so the dentist has referred the person into the cleft team and, they, and they've made a decision based on that referral that they don't need to see that person again. I can only assume that's because they were given information on the patient's predicament and they've made a decision that is not complex enough to require hospital dental services. Obviously, the, there are details within the case there where, where those decisions are, 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 are made. Um, in which case that person then has to have their front tooth replacement done in dental practice away from the hospital dental services. And, and there are several different ways of giving uh, a person a missing front tooth. Again, the most complicated and the most expensive way of doing that is with a dental implant. So I strongly suspect if that's the treatment the patient is, is preferring or would prefer to have, you'd have to try and find that in the private dental arena. There are other ways of giving people their missing front tooth back. And some of those ways are done through NHS primary dental care, dental practice scenarios. But I suspect that's what's happened there. The cleft service has decided the case is not complicated and can be fixed in dental practice by standard dental means. Okay, thanks Matt. Uh, next question, um, do you have to pay for dental treatment in the hospital? I'm an adult and need to be referred back to the cleft team due to ongoing complications, for example, fistula and dentures not fitting. And there's a second part also, can you have a weak septum as an adult? Oh, okay. So the first part of that, again, we, we partly answered those types yeah. of questions. So if this person gets referred back into the hospital services, and is seen through the cleft team, and they have treatment, that treatment would be free. Mm -hmm. um, they have to have a certain amount of complexity, and it sounds like this person is reasonably complex because they have a fistula in their palate. Sounds like they've had a dentist to try and help close that hole in the past. They probably need a new one. So yes, that could be done via the hospital cleft services. And then the second part of that question was, I'm sorry, I've forgotten. It was, can you have a weak septum? As oh, okay. Now, weak septum, I'm going to make some assumptions. Are we talking about the septum that's in the patient's nose? So I'm going to point to the middle of my nose now. Or are they talking about some aspect within their mouth where they've got a fistula? Uh, I'm, I'm unsure. Um, either way, um, this is very much the remit of perhaps the the maxillofacial surgeons that deal with fixing problems deep within the person's palate or indeed within their nose. Uh, so I, I, I can't really comment, but I, I do sit in um, meetings where patients discuss issues high up in their palate, within their nose, and there can, of course, be problems with the septum in that position. Um, I, 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 perhaps weak is the wrong word. Certainly they can be deviated. They can be an incorrect or in the wrong position, which I know can then lead on to problems with both breathing and speech. So there would be an expert on the, the, the cleft team that would be able to look at and discuss what might be going on there and whether something needs to be done about it. I have certainly heard of people having surgical procedures done to their septum to try and improve whatever their problem was. That's probably as far as I can go with that answer. Okay. Thanks a lot, Matt. Thank you. Great, thank you. And this is one of the last questions now. So um, do keep with us when we're nearly there. Um, okay, so I, I've read this question and I kind of relate to this on a small scale. Um, so my personal experience has been that dentists are not interested in knowing about my cleft palate and the physical impact of this 
such as misalignment of the jaw and bite, etc. I experience jaw discom discomfort and have been informed that my teeth are not domed in shape as they should be. I can't afford to pay for my teeth to be cleaned, and this is no longer offered during my checkup anymore. Are all dentists knowledgeable on patients for with a cleft? And what should I see uh, my general dentist for? And when should I be asking to see the cleft team dentist? Okay, well, so we've got several aspects to, to, to cover there. Um, perhaps I, I, I'm going to start with the issue of the domed teeth. I, I only mention that because I'm not entirely sure where that part of the conversation is heading. Most certainly, cleft lip and palate patient can have teeth that can be an inappropriate shape. They might be the wrong shape. They might require some sort of corrective dentistry to alter the shape. But dome-shaped teeth, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what we mean by that aspect of the question. Um, move on to the next part. Uh, the person was asking about the concept of um, scaling, polishing, whether that happens as part of uh, a dental checkup. Um, they are two separate items, um, so you don't always have to have a scale and polish with your dental checkup. Dental checkup comes first, and then if that dental clinician finds out that you would benefit from a scale and polish, then they would advise you and, and then move you forward to have that type of treatment. I'm sure Rhiannon can comment a little bit more on that uh, in a moment. Um, and I think the first part of the question was, are dentists aware of of the difficulties associated with cleft lip and palate. Uh, so yeah, that's correct. Uh, most certainly, um, dental clinicians as part of their undergraduate training are taught about cleft lip and palate. Some of those dentists will then go on when they work in practice, they will happily embrace the concept of cleft lip and palate and the dental difficulties. So they will see people for checkups and they will undertake treatments that are required. There will be some dentists that are, are really unsure about that field. And they might shy away from the concept of actually performing the treatment. But in that case, if they are unsure, they should then refer to someone who can deal with whatever the dental problem is. So they should refer into their local cleft lip and palate team where you will come across someone who is specialized in, in that type of treatment and can go forward and provide the treatment. Or perhaps, if the treatment is very straightforward, I'll call it standard dental treatment again, it might be that the cleft team write back to the dentist and give them information on what they should do and, and how they do it. Okay, So sometimes we do have that reciprocal approach to, to treatment of, of, of dental patients. So I would hope to think all dentists will take an interest, but there might be some that don't actually go forward and do the treatment, so then they should refer on. Have I answered all aspects of that question? Rihanna, I don't know if you want to comment a little more on the on the, the cleaning aspect. Yeah, OK, thank you. The, I mean, I, from what I can understand without being able to ask any further questions is that you used to be offered cleaning after you've had your checkup and you're no longer offered it as part of an NHS um, setup that you're. I'm assuming being asked to pay privately for it. Um, I, I must add here that NHS dentistry isn't free for everyone anyway. It's you, most people pay for NHS dentistry unless they are exempt for whatever reason, like Dr. Locke was saying earlier. Um, but it used to be covered under the sort of band one. So there's different bandings, the different amount that you pay and what that covers. And it did used to be covered. If a practice goes private, it is then up to them to decide how much to charge for each individual item of treatment. Um, so as I think I said earlier, it can be worth shopping around. It might be that at your dental practice, you consider the appointment with the hygienist to be out of your price range, but there could be other practices locally where the, the price isn't so much. And a lot of practices do something under agreement called direct access. So you can access the care of a dental hygienist or a dental therapist directly without needing to see a dentist. You don't need a referral, but you would need to obviously do your little bit of shopping to find out which practices and which hygienists and therapists offer this. And it could be that you then would go. When you have your checkup, your dentist at least once a year should be doing a very basic sort of gum checkup, I suppose is the way to think about it. And those scores would determine whether you need a, a clean or not. And actually, sometimes people don't. If they get scores of noughts and ones, it might just be oral hygiene advice that we can give, a demonstration of a particular toothbrush, but that actually you don't 
always need a clean. Um, so it could also be that, but it, it is quite difficult to answer without being able to ask you a, a few more questions. But it's, I think it was worth just saying, it might be worth shopping around and looking for something that, you know, yes, you might have to pay for, but is nearer to the fee you would have paid with the NHS in the first place. I think it, it, it might be worth adding at this point, Rhiannon, you, you know this as well as I do, that about five years or so ago, the, the concepts of um, gum issues, cleaning, scaling and polishing in dental practice and underwent a field change, a very significant change. I'm old enough to remember the time when absolutely every patient that sat in the chair had a scale and polish immediately there and then. But of course, we are a little more informed now. And there are people, patients that do not need a scale and polish because they have an excellent ability to keep their teeth clean and to look after their gums themselves. So, so don't be surprised if, if, if a, a dental clinician said to you, you don't need to scale and polish. There's nothing that I need to scale and polish away. Um, and as Rihanna said, there are some very simple checks that the dental team can do on gums to find out whether you fall into the category of requiring cleaning or not. And, and of course, anyone that is my age or older will remember the concept of seeing the dentist every six months. That's really gone by the by now. You, you don't have to see uh, visit dental practice every six months. It depends on your risk, how prone you are to dental diseases. So again, there will be people that have fantastic levels of oral hygiene. They have a wonderful diet. They've got no dental disease at all. Well, they don't need to be seen maybe every 18 months or so. And then, of course, there'll be people at the other end of the spectrum where we would want to see them more regularly to catch things early. It could be, if you're a cleft lip and palate patient, maybe you are at that end of the spectrum. Maybe you require a little more attentive care, a little more often to ensure things don't start to go wrong. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think personally, I, I feel the need to go every six months just to have a checkup, just to make sure everything's okay. I think it's also been ingrained in my nature of so many years of being so um, conditioned with going to a dentist and, and being really into you to clean your teeth really well so I, I agree with that That's down to the individual I believe um there is one more question just coming at the q and a from Facebook I think this will be the last one now um is fissure sealant important to have applied to teeth as often as the fluoride okay I'm happy happy to answer that one <laughs> If I had a pound for every fissure sealant and fluoride varnish application that I've ever done in my entire career, I'd be in the Bermuda uh, or Bahamas right now. But um, no, so the guideline from would always consider a child who has um, had a repair for a cleft lip and palate to be high risk. So we, we follow guidelines that allow us to deliver the best health and they're all evidence based. Anyone who's considered to be more at high risk is treated in a more high risk way. And one of those ways is to provide fissure sealant. So for anyone who doesn't know what a fissure sealant is, if you look at the biting surface of, of a molar, I always think I explain it to children like mountains with valleys in between. Um, and those valleys are where it's a little bit harder to clean. And for children with a cleft lip who might be more prone to decay, and the, the studies show that they are, one of the ways we can prevent decay is to basically make those valleys more shallow. So it's a plastic resin a bit like anyone who's had gel nails done with the blue light, it's the same kind of thing. So it's not a filling at all. It's running this sort of liquid into those fissures to make them easier to clean. And the blue light um, just makes it go hard. They'll wear it off and fall off eventually, but they'll have got that child through that high risk period. That's a sort of more permanent way of doing it. So you sometimes have to have fissure sealants reapplied, but put on properly, they should last a long time. The other thing that they've asked about is fluoride varnish, which is just painting a higher level of fluoride uh, varnish on the tooth that, that can last up to three months. So unless there are medical conditions that mean we can't use it, we would be expected high risk patients to have it done every three months. And I would think of it that your toothpaste is low dose, but high frequency because you use it every day where fluoride varnish is high dose, low frequency, both very, very rich evidence based to, to show that they work. Um, and, and yes, if it were my child, I suppose that that's what people want to know. Yes, I would let them have that if they'd had a repaired cleft lip and palate. But the, the evidence as to why children with a repaired cleft lip and palate often have more theories is still a little bit sketchy. But it's thought that it's probably more to do with the fact that they don't clear their mouths quite as quickly with food. So with the way that the tongue sort of cleanses the palate, the way it moves around the mouth, food gets stuck in 
gets left in there a bit longer. And obviously we know that it's the amount of time that, that food is in contact with the teeth, the cleanliness of the teeth, the type of food you've eaten, all of those factors mean that you're a little bit more prone to decay. So anything that can sort of act as a barrier to strengthen the enamel or act as a barrier between food and the tooth, you've still got to brush them, but it makes it a little bit more effective. I hope that answers that question. Is there anything you would add to that, Matt? No, it might be worth mentioning that there's been a lot of research done on the concept of fish sealants and varnishes over the last well, decade or so. Um, and there is a school of thought that is maybe suggesting that the fish sealants are not always required and the fluoride varnishes will do just as good a job, just in case anyone encounters someone from the, 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 the team who says, we're not going to do fish sealants, we're going to do fluoride varnish. There are reasons as to why they make, might make that decision, but they, they, they are both effective. Thank you both. I am just going to sneak in one last question that we've had come in on the chat. Um, my son has recently been treated for cervical resorption on one of his teeth under the gum. He is 17 and still has some adult teeth to come down. Is he now prone to other teeth being affected? And is there anything he can do to reduce the chance of it happening again? Okay, that's interesting. So it's an interesting condition whereby, uh, and this is my best attempt at explaining it, um, aspects of the hard part of the tooth tend to get chewed away. Um, it can either happen on the outside of the tooth, or in fact, sometimes it can happen from the inside to the outside of the tooth. Uh, it tends to happen at the gum line. So often people have no clue that's happening until it's a little bit later in the process. And then maybe when they have a dental checkup, someone finds it. Um, occasionally it might get to the stage where it starts to cause some pain or some toothache. And that's why someone then investigates it further. Um, I'm afraid many of those cases, we don't know why it happens. It can be linked to certain things. Dental trauma is probably one of the more common reasons. So if you've had a knock on a tooth or you've bashed a tooth, it might be that months down the line, this process happens. Um, in those situations, of course, we would be hoping that it only affects the one tooth and, and that is it. In my career, I have seen exceedingly small numbers of people where they've been unfortunate enough to have that process on multiple teeth. Again, no great reasons as, as to why that's happening. Um, depending on how advanced it is, how severe it is, as to whether someone in the dental team can do something to help it. So if it's caught early, then there are some dental treatments, some filling type dental treatments that you, you can have undertaken to halt it and save the tooth. If it's much later in the process, that tooth is often then weakened. Uh, and no amount of filling is going to save it. And then that person might end up having the tooth taken out and replaced in some way. So I would hope this is a, a, a one-off occurrence for this 17-year-old, I think it was. Um, maybe there's a link with, with some sort of trauma accident in the past, possibly. Um, but I say there are, there are more rare cases whereby people have multiple teeth that are affected by this. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate you taking the time to answer that last one there. Um, so that's all the time that we have for tonight, I'm afraid. Um, so I hope it's been useful for everybody. If you would be able to provide us with any feedback, we would be really, really grateful. There will be a link to this, uh, hopefully, in the chat just into the video. Uh, additionally, just a quick reminder that Clapper's annual survey is now also live. And you can find this if you just go to clapper.com forward slash survey. Again, there'll be a link to this uh, in the chat feature underneath the video here. Um, there's a section that asks about any concerns you might have around uh, healthcare, including dental health and access to NHS dentistry. Um, so we can use this information at Clapper to identify the biggest concerns for people that are affected by cleft and we can decide then as a charity what to prioritise. Thank you so much and some very uh, important thank you. So firstly, thank you so much to Mina, Matt and Rhiannon uh, for giving up your time to talk to us. It's hugely appreciated and I'm sure everyone watching feels the same way right now. Um, thank you to our young people, Grace and Alana, who joined us earlier to share their story with all of us. It was so insightful and a real treat to have you guys with us. Uh, super brave of you to, to tell us about your journey. Um, 
thank you as well to everyone who has joined us on Facebook page straight away. And uh, a subtitled version will be posted on the Clapper YouTube page as soon as possible. Um, and of course, a big thank you to Ellie for taking your time out as a volunteer to host as well alongside myself this evening. Oh, thanks, Davin. Thank you to you too um, for volunteering. Lastly, we should also say a big thank you to our funders, the National Lottery Community Fund and to Smile Train. Uh, it's been a really good evening. If we didn't get around to answering your questions in the chat, remember you can get in touch anytime um, simply at info at clapper.com. Clapper staff can help to point you in the right direction. Um, so we really hope you've enjoyed the Q&A and that we'll see you again at one of our upcoming online events in the future. Uh, so from everybody here, good night and have a lovely rest of your week. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.